Welcome to Living Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. My guest this week is Sasha Sisko. Sasha is a non-binary author, a student of ethnopharmacology, an integration coach, and an advocate for social justice. Sasha advocates for a focus on indigenous communities, environmental justice, marginalized populations, and communities that focus on recovery from addiction. In recent years, Sasha has been working on a book called Graced by Nature, a work that focuses on the history of psychedelics, psychedelic research, religious freedom and traditional indigenous use, as well as the modern psychotherapeutic use of psychedelics. Today, we talk about the legal history of psychedelics in the US, from prohibition in the 60s and 70s through to the ayahuasca churches of today. Hope you enjoy the conversation. Okay, I'm here with Sasha Sisko. Sasha, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. This is going to be a fun time. Yeah. Um, so maybe we can begin with your kind of personal background and how you, you came to become an advocate for, in the kind of psychedelic space. Well, that's a rather long story, but I'll try and keep it brief for you. Uh, as an adult, I dealt with severe depression, social anxiety, and PTSD stemming from traumatic events earlier in my life. And after many rounds of antidepressants and ineffective forms of therapy, I had come to the point where essentially I'd lost the will to live. But after learning about the psilocybin studies over at Johns Hopkins, I decided to place my blue chips on the line and undergo the experience myself. And although I was atheistic at the time, I uh, underwent uh, what could only be described as a conversion experience, which profoundly shifted my worldview and outlook on life. And the experience led me to uh, experienced significantly less depression, uh, other negative emotions stemming from those traumatic events early in my life. And I was able to recover from worsening agoraphobia, uh, anorexia, depression. Uh, because of all of these facts, the experience reinvigorated me to uh, uh, transform my faith into a, I guess what you might call a form of uh, Gnostic, mystic, uh, Christianity. After I became uh, fully aware of the potential of these medicines, I decided to cultivate a desire to raise awareness about these substances and their potential for those with mental illnesses, the spiritually impoverished, uh, malnourished, and uh, as Bob Jesse puts it, uh, for the betterment of well people. Uh, researching the topic for several years has led me to become an advocate for indigenous communities, marginalized populations, and the recovery community as well. Uh, my efforts as of late have went into raising awareness about an unconstitutional provision that's within Florida's religious freedom laws, uh, which specifically target faiths which utilize entheogens as sacraments. Now, as far as I'm aware, uh, I'm the only scholar who's written on the topic, much less addressed it in any substantive manner. And it's a fairly interesting topic uh, for the psychedelic community to discuss. And perhaps we can talk about it later on in the podcast. But uh, yeah, I think that wraps it up pretty well. But um, I did want to let the audience know that I do have a little set of notes here to uh, make sure that I uh, uh, get everything across. These are fairly simple questions, but they aren't usually answered in a nuanced manner. And that's why we're doing this whole thing. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to promise that I won't do any Nixon impressions, at least at first. Is that fair? Okay. Yeah, that's fair. And you have a book okay. right, that you're going to have out soon on, on Kindle, is that, is that right? Yes. Uh, the name of it is Graced by Nature. It's uh, essentially a, uh, it's a nonfiction book which addresses all of these issues that we're going to be talking about today and more, uh, along with my own personal uh, connection to the psychedelic movement, how I became involved. Right. And if we kind of uh, delve into, you know, into the stuff, you go a lot into like, the history of psychedelics uh, to unpack the kind of the relevant questions around the kind of religious freedom and, and these legal issues. So if we focus on, you know, obviously, in indigenous uses, substances have been, have been used for a very long time. But in the West, LSD was the thing that kind of burst onto the scene in mid 20th century. Um, and so maybe you can tell us a bit about how LSD first kind of escaped the laboratories and the clinics and uh, got into kind of underground use. Well, it's really interesting because uh, the answer to that wasn't really uh, the underground chemists or the black market at first. It was actually the researchers who were handling these substances uh, now, in the 50s, in the 1950s, Sandoz Pharmaceuticals was the only distributor of LSD 
and related medications, uh, they had a foothold on the control. There weren't really any other people making it. Uh, they were distributing it only to qualified researchers who were using it as an adjunct in psychotherapy, uh, not only as a diagnostic aid, but as a uh, pharmacological tool to elicit the servicing of subconscious material, which could be addressed and integrated in subsequent talk therapy sessions. Uh, but after, at a certain point, researchers began to realize that those who were best qualified to administer these medicines to patients were those researchers who had taken the medicines themselves. Essentially, the idea was that if they were to be familiar with the subjective effects of these medications, they could better understand how to utilize them when administering them to patients. Uh, so in effect, they would often administer LSD, DMT, mescaline, psilocybin, ethocybin, or other analogs to themselves. Uh, beyond this, they wanted to better understand the lived experiences of their patients who had dealt with various mental illnesses. The prevailing notion at the time was that LSD could induce or mimic a form of psychosis or schizophrenia, uh, so described by the now defunct and obsolete term psychotomimetic. Uh, by the end of the 50s, uh, the term began to face backlash for its lack of accuracy and the term psychedelic, meaning mind manifesting, took its place. Now, by 1960, uh, LSD, research was, was, uh, LSD research was coming along well, and there were dozens of researchers who had grown to enjoy the subjective effects of LSD, not because it induced some sort of enjoyable psychosis or uh, narcotic type haze, but because I guess the way that they might describe it was that it was intellectually stimulating. So these researchers, uh, these people would begin to take their supply of Delicid home and share it with uh, their colleagues, their friends at relaxed evening parties. Uh, there's one really famous incident where uh, you might know this, where a British dentist, you know where I'm going with this? Yeah, yeah, Michael it, something. No, 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 Dr. Oh, Robert, he does. Oh, of course. Yes. It most likely the Beatles. Yeah, sur mm -hmm. surreptitiously dosed John Lennon and George Harrison with purified LSD. Uh, it was later immortalized in that song, Dr. Robert. Uh, Harrison later reflected on the event, and at the time, oh boy, he didn't even know what LSD was or what it could, what these subjective effects were, and I can't even imagine what that. <laughs> experience must have been like. But anyway, uh, somehow throughout the course of the evening, they went to a local concert. They had driven there themselves. And in the wee hours of the morning, had driven back to their hotel, luckily, without incident. But um, uh, people like uh, Dr. Sidney Cohen, who was the director of the Division of Narcotic Division at the National Institute of Mental Health, he had made public statements uh, public notices about the fact that these researchers were diverting their supply of delicid and indocybin to their friends and saying, you know, wagging his finger saying, uh, this is going to become a problem. It's going to be get into the black market at some point. And soon enough, it did. Uh, positive press coverage of LSD research in the early 60s led to increased demand in the black market. So uh, several clandestine chemists began to learn the very complex method of synthesizing LSD uh, compared to other synthetic drugs, such as, uh, let's say, methamphetamine. LSD synthesis is incredibly tedious and requires extensive knowledge of organic chemistry. So a lot of the early synthesis attempts were just utter failures. Uh, but the first documented LSD bust came in early 1963. Uh, when uh, Bernard Copley and Bernard Roseman uh, sold LSD to an undercover agent, eek. Uh, they were tipped off by a researcher, uh, Myron Stolaroff, to those who know him. Uh, so these two uh, Bernies <laughs> were actually charged with violating the Kefauver Harris Amendment of 1962. Uh, that amendment, among other things, prohibited the mislabeling of medications. So they weren't technically charged with possession of LSD. They were charged with a technical violation of the Food, Drugs, and Cosmetics Act. At the time, there weren't any laws which prohibited the possession of LSD. So, yeah, um, uh, Copley and Roseman weren't the only two LSD chemists at the time. There were plenty of others, but because of the fact that law enforcement 
wasn't able to catch them. We don't really know who most of them were, but the next really big player on the scene was Owsley Stanley, uh, known as Bear. Uh, this chemist began to synthesize LSD in 1963. Uh, he was actually inspired by the uh, Bernie, uh, 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 Bernie Bros, as I called them, <laughs> but... Um, uh, he started uh, synthesizing LSD, and by '65, get this, he was a uh, he was busted, but he was charged with uh, uh, illicit manufacture of methamphetamine. And because the uh, analyses of the laboratory materials that were seized indicated that he wasn't synthesizing methamphetamine, the charges against him were dropped. And not only that he successfully sued for the return of his lab equipment. Mm -hmm. So he got everything back, moved everything over to California and started hooking up with, uh, you might've known them, uh, Nick Sand and Tim Scully. Uh, they really began to churn out LSD and other uh, tryptamine, phenethylamine analogs. Um, uh, the, uh, the thing that really got them going was the fact that they were able to distribute their materials to rather sell their materials to uh, the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, who had the network to distribute these materials all across the country. Uh, so yeah, while there were many small time LSD dealers in the San Francisco scene, it was the Hells Angels who actually got it across the nation. Um, the Brotherhood of Eternal Love also had, had a hand to play in it, but that's another story unto itself. Um, now, one story is related to adverse reactions from LSD and these analogs began to appear in the uh, newspapers. It really began to accelerate the public concern. Uh, uh, not only was LSD being sold, there was another material uh, called a DOM. Are you familiar with it? No. Uh, essentially, it was first synthesized in 1963 by uh, Alexander Shasha uh, Shulgin. Um, and because he had shared the method of its synthesis with, I believe it was Stanley. It might have been a Scully or Sand. It was one of them. But they had gotten a hold of the synthesis and decided to start making uh, DOM. It's a substituted amphetamine, which uh, has effects which border somewhere between amphetamine and mescaline. It, uh, it has effects which last for about 72 hours. And unfortunately, because the, uh, the drug has a delayed onset, a lot of people thought that the material was just weak LSD, so they doubled or tripled their dose. And before they knew it, they wound up in the ER reporting anxiety, hallucinations, tremors. Um, not a really good uh, scene because doctors didn't know how to treat it at the time, uh, chlorpromazine had been used to successfully treat LSD overdoses, but uh, doctors quickly realized that chlorpromazine was contraindicated with SCP overdoses. And uh, to add on to this, um, if people reported that it was actually uh, that they had taken STP, that was the street name for it, uh, short for Serenity, Tranquility, and Peace, Doc doctors didn't know what that was. They didn't know that it was DOM, that it was a substituted amphetamine. So they were literally working with patients who didn't even know what they took. It was a really bad scene. So um, uh, all in all, th this quickly led to an escalating uh, public concern for what was going on over in San Francisco and beyond. Okay, so you have this kind of moral panic, you know, kind of coming on the scene as there's a lot of fear of, you know, a lot of it, I'm sure, genuine. Um, but then it kind of, ask, you know, gets picked up by the press and gets kind of distorted and starts to become a kind of political tool. Um, so then if we move to the, so in the third, this is kind of the first half of the 60s, right, when there's no legislation around LSD. But then if we move to the kind of second half, perhaps you could tell us a bit about how, how LSD actually came to be prohibited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, once uh, Congress became aware of what was going on, they decided to act on it like they do. And... Uh... Uh, they passed what was known as the Drug Abuse Control Amendments in July of 1965. Uh, I call it DACA for short, even though the uh, there's another <laughs> piece of legislation which ha has the same acronym. Um, I call it DACA. Anyway, um, that piece of legislation specifically enabled the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare 
uh, to amend the catalog of controlled substances to include compounds which had shown evidence for, quotes, a potential for abuse because of its depressant or stimulant effect on the nervous system or its hallucinogenic effect, end quote. Now, at the time, there weren't any specific substances enumerated within the legislation, so it just stood as was. It wasn't until January of 1966 in the following year that Dr. James Goddard was sworn in as the head of the FDA. And on his second day of the job, uh, he published a notice in the Federal Register, which among other things had listed several serotonergic compounds, which he had described as hallucinogens. Um, and following that uh, cue, uh, uh, Secretary of uh, Health, Education, and Welfare, uh, John Gardner, had added not only LSD, but the entheogens peyote, mescaline, psilocybin, uh, bufotenin, and DMT, among others, I believe also ibogaine, uh, to the catalog of controlled substances. And that specific uh, amendment to the legislation would go in effect in mid-May of 1966, uh, while uh, while smoking related and alcohol related deaths were on the rise, unfortunately. But um, uh, it's interesting at the time because that was the first federal law which prohibited the possession of LSD by unqualified researchers and the general population. At the time though, it's interesting because there wasn't really any teeth to the legislation, there was a, actually a provision within the legislation which allowed people to possess the substance for, I think the phrase was personal use, but the way that it was utilized was that if, let's say a police officer were to find somebody who had possessed LSD that wasn't being used for legitimate research purposes, they could seize it but they wouldn't charge them with a crime. So it, it still uh, prohibited the possession, but it didn't criminalize the possession. That didn't really happen until the Controlled Substances Act in 1970. That was drafted by Nixon's legal aides in 1969, reviewed by Congress, but uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that once we talk, uh, we'll talk about Nixon, yeah. Okay. And before we get there, most people are familiar you know, with Timothy Leary, the kind of Harvard psychologist who was who was caught up in, well, put himself in the middle of all of this stuff with his rather large ego. Um, and he often gets the kind of blame as as the person who you know, was telling all the kids of America to turn on, tune in and drop out. Um, do you think he deserves the kind of blame for, for what happened with the prohibition? He deserves a lot of the blame. You, you can't say that he was the only person. I actually, uh, f uh, f for this podcast, I actually made a list of a dozen other people slash factors that had led to what happened. And while more or less Larry deserves, I'll, I'll say this, he, does, he, he deserves the dishonor of having pushed back the uh, field of psychedelic research by three decades. Uh, pretty much all research had ended by 1970 because of the provisions of the Controlled Substances Act. And uh, modern research didn't really begin until uh, Rick Strassman's uh, DMT study and uh, Griffith's over at uh, Hopkins in the early 2000s. But um, just to give everyone a better idea of what uh, Timmy Leary was all about, um, before he was uh, the uh, high, known as the high priest of LSD, he was actually an eminent psychologist who had uh, become very influential within the uh, psychology community. He'd actually published um, a very influential work called The Interpersonal Diagnosis of Personality, which helped, uh, which helped in the identification of various uh, personality types. Uh, and after flexing his charm uh, in front of a Harvard official, he had, uh, he was able to uh, win his way into a position as a lecturer at Harvard, uh, not as a professor, like some people like to say that isn't technically true. He was a lecturer. Um, so uh, 
the middle-aged psych uh, clinical psychologist, secured his job at Harvard starting in uh, fall of 1960. And just weeks before he began his first semester, he vacationed in Mexico, of all places, and was given his uh, uh, first dose of uh, psychedelic mushrooms, uh, uh, essentially, um, uh, before this, he had only drank alcohol, hadn't even smoked cannabis. So this was a uh, much uh, uh, all too different from the uh, alcohol-induced haze that he was used to uh, enjoying. Uh, he would reflect on his first experience at that Cuernavacan uh, hotel pool in really powerful terms that he had, quote, learned more in the six or seven hours of that experience than he had in all of his years as a psychologist. Um, once he returned to Massachusetts in the following weeks, he initiated the Harvard psilocybin project because he was just so enthralled by the potential of these medicines. Uh, he hadn't yet actually worked with LSE that came uh, uh, came in a year or two, but um, uh, he got uh, Dr. Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzer to join in the project with him. And while the vast majority of these studies were, explore, uh, were exploratory in nature, they unfortunately lacked the scientific rigor of modern clinical trials. Uh, they suffered from a lack of a control group. There was uh, the, uh, there was no double blind procedure, and um, so, so it didn't really. Uh, when we look back at these studies, they don't really. They don't give us the same confidence in the results. We, we can't achieve the same confidence in the results as we can with modern studies. Uh, with these sort of studies, they were simply just giving the compounds to people and having them describe their experiences. That was more or less it. Um, uh, shortly after these uh, projects began, Alice, uh, Leary had actually taken LSD for the first time uh, with the help of a friend. Uh, he had a very interesting and prophetic uh, experience. Um, he was watching himself on a quote, ancient television show directed and designed by an unknown intelligence. And the role he played in his own words was that of quote, the pathetic clown, the shallow, corny, 20th century American, the classic buffoon, completely caught up in a world of his own making. Uh, at this point in time, the press was still treating LSD and psilocybin favorably when describing the novel forms, uh, when describing the novel pharmaceuticals, but now that there were these charismatic researchers at Harvard who were giving LSD and psilocybin to graduate students in, control, in controlled settings, the media was quick to sensationalize the topic as if it were the subject of some ongoing soap opera and, and it, uh, just to get away from it all. And uh, in April of 1962, Larry and his colleagues actually went down to Zihuatanejo, Mexico to rent out an entire hotel uh for months several months a year at a time something like that anyway uh so that they could essentially do as they pleased uh routine lsd parties were described as research sessions and this all came to a halt by june of 1963 when local newspapers had actually reported on what leary was doing uh one really interesting uh article uh, alleged that he had brought with him, quote, marijuana orgies, hairy women, black magic, venereal disease, and profiteering. Lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Uh, <laughs> sitting over to Antigua, uh, Leary and his cohorts thought that they had found permanent refuge after they'd been kicked out of Mexico, but by August, their plans were derailed. Uh, one of their party, party goers had arrived at, uh, had uh, greeted a local lobotomist in town. He had uh, arrived, uh, shown up in a bathing suit and strung out from LSD. He had requested that the doctor perform a lobotomy on him because uh, as he, as he said, he wanted to prevent Leary from quote, making a pact with the devil. This didn't bode well for Leary and his friends. So they were kicked out of Antigua. And uh, well, they decided to just 
try and turn on America instead. So um, it, it, it became more and more clear that he was impervious to the notion that he was on the wrong path. Um, as Hunter Thompson later put it, there were plenty of quote, grim meat hook realities lying in wait for all the people who took him seriously. All those pathetically eager acid freaks who thought they could buy peace and understanding for three bucks a hit. Uh, earlier in May, Leary had actually been fired uh, from his job as a lecturer at Harvard. He had essentially gone AWOL, just left the building, <laughs> never returned. Um, there was a uh, undergraduate thesis that he was supposed to review that was just lying on his desk. Spider webs had literally accumulated on top of it. Um, after he'd been fired, the scandal uh, inspired a bunch of international headlines. This inspired one reporter to come down to Mexico to get a quote from Larry to see, you know, what he thought about the whole thing. And uh, with that trademark grin of his, uh, he told the reporter that he was, quote, honored and that it couldn't have happened to two nicer guys. Uh, the other nice guy uh, was Dr. Richard Alpert who had unfortunately been fired for allegedly giving uh, undergraduates LSD in return for sexual favors. I have never been able to substantiate those claims and I don't think uh, Ram Dass ever, uh, he never really talked much about it, but that's definitely something to uh, discuss with the modern lens, I think. But anyway, um. Uh, though the growing body of psychedelic research indicated an upcoming paradigm shift within the healthcare industry by 1963, black market LSD was now available as a street drug. And by this time, that political firebrand, Leary, had captured the nation's attention by touring the country to espouse the virtues of LSD. He actually upended the federal cannabis prohibition by, get this, uh, appealing a minor possession case all the way to the Supreme Court. He ran against Ronald Reagan for governor of California. This guy led a really interesting life. He aided drug smuggling operations. He escaped prison with the aid of domestic terrorists. He caught a $5 million bounty. He led the Nixon administration on a 28 month wild goose chase of an international manhunt, which ended in Afghanistan. He shared a fulsome prison cell block with Charlie Manson. Uh, in 1968, uh, then candidate Nixon described Timothy Leary as, quote, the most dangerous man in America. Uh, Leary would uh, reflect on this uh, honor and called, it, and, and called it his, quote, Nobel Prize. He really uh, enjoyed the uh, relationship that he had with Nixon uh, for better or for worse, but uh, he effectively undermined the early psychedelic research movements and essentially invited a near outright moratorium on the entire field. And his morally bankrupt choice to advocate for the personal use of LSD at the time prompted concern by his colleagues in Harvard, those within governments, and um, interestingly, uh, unknown to most people, uh, Leary, uh, despite the fact that he was a well-educated Harvard lecturer and eminent psychologist, he'd actually diagnosed himself as a psychopath early in the uh, early 60s, late 50s, uh, early 60s. Uh, he, the story was that he was uh, at a relaxed uh, uh, event with Charles Slack, one of his colleagues, and he had um, gotten into this discussion uh, saying that, you know, you know, I really am a psychopath. And he asked uh, Charles Slack how many violations of the American Psychological Code of Ethics that he had made. Slack said, yeah, I don't think any, probably. And Leary had said that he had violated every single one except those related to money. <sighs> so definitely something to think about, but um, getting back to uh, the national spotlight, his that six word anthem of his, turn on, tune in, drop out, that inspired countless young Americans to abandon contemporary culture, pursue psychedelic hedonism. He had effectively spent three decades subverting the will of the government by reminding his followers to quote, think for yourself and question authority.
now uh, this uh, <laughs> uh, he rarely mints words, especially in public speaking events. Uh, in February of 1967, he was addressing students at the University of Toronto, and he had told them that, quote, you must drop out of school. Your education system is a narcotic addictive process, end quote, supported by a, quote, madhouse government, end quote, comprised of, get this, quote, almost senile and probably impotent men, end quote, shipping the nation's youth out to war. Uh, but perhaps the most shocking of Leary's public statements uh, came from his open letter of a prison escape note. After the uh, weatherman had helped him escape jail, he had, uh, uh, released a letter where he had informed his quote comrades that shooting a quote genocidal police excuse me a genocidal robot policeman in the defense of life is a sacred act these sort of messages did not play well with most americans especially those with conservative values and because of this, the medical utilization of LSD and related substances often became conflated with the lifestyle and philosophies that Larry helped promote. And uh, just to give people a better idea of how he escaped prison, this is a really interesting story. Uh, in September of 1970, the 49-year-old high priest of LSD uh, was locked up after having been denied bail for a marijuana possession charge. Uh, snubbing his nose at the political establishment, he had actually left a small newspaper article that was affixed to his prison-issued prison footlocker. In the article were quotes by then-Governor Ronald Reagan, you know, the guy he ran against, uh, and there were underlined quotes saying that Leary should, uh, that Leary was not a... Uh, that he was not a threat to the public and that he should uh, deserve to be placed in a minimum security prison. The gall of this guy. So he uh, gets out into the yard, scales the perimeter of the jail, climbs hand over hand across a telephone wire for I think like 50 yards, shimmies down a telephone pole and awaits for this unmarked vehicle to come pick him up. He shaves his head bald uh, 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 gets a forged passport and eventually makes his way over to Algeria where he uh, temporarily lives in exiled chapter of the Black Panther Party. This just makes for really interesting press for Leary and the movement itself. Uh, and by the time that Leary's in Algeria, Nixon was becoming aware of his dropping ratings, approval ratings that is, and uh, he privately admitted to Treasury Secretary uh, John Connolly that he felt that his work wasn't getting through to the American people. Uh, so in an effort to change the spirits of the president, uh, uh, Connolly had in his own special way uh, suggested to the president that it might be a good idea to vilify the symbolic leader of the drug, uh, the drug epidemic to the extent that it's stuck in the minds of people. Now Nixon thought this was a good idea. This could uh, definitely uh, this could definitely do something for his ratings. Now there was a bunch of cross talk in the Oval Office, and uh, Connolly, uh, with his thick Southern draw, uh, reminds everyone about the the guy who went to Algeria. Now, now that everyone's laughing about the reference to Leary, uh, Nixon turtled that. Well, we definitely have room in the prison system for him. Nixon was really lucky. The, the most perfect scapegoat for the drug epidemic had literally fallen into his hands. Less than a week after, yeah, less than a week after newspapers began reporting that uh, Leary had found refuge in Algeria, Nixon had signed the Controlled Substances Act into law. I mean, the, the, the timing is just really, yeah. And uh, interestingly, by the time that uh, he was caught, that was within a week of Nixon's uh, second inauguration in 1972. The timing is just really interesting in all these things. Yeah, so this sets the kind of background against which Nixon's prohibition of psychedelics came into, came into effect. And this was kind of, yeah, you have the kind of hedonism of the youth, right, that, that Leary is amping up 
And that's tied in with the kind of, you know, you're saying about advocating people think for themselves and you have um, that kind of anti-war left part of that, the youth who are not going to Vietnam, and you also have the civil rights movement. And in that context, you have this, this moral panic of, you know, in which Nixon claims he's looking out for public health with this war on drugs. But it seems in retrospect, that's really not what it was about, right? Yeah, um, he definitely put on the patina of the idea that we were trying to safeguard the public health and curb the drug abuse epidemic. But really what the new drug legislation was all about was that Nixon and his aides had conspired to not only target, but also investigate, harass, and incarcerate his enemies by uh, giving the executive branch essentially unbridled power. Uh, there was a really great article that came out in April of 2016 in Harper's Magazine. Uh, Dan Baum had uh, was uh, was lucky enough to interview uh, John Ehrlichman, who had served as the former legal counsel of the Nixon White House. So you know this wasn't some minor uh, White House aide. He was buddy buddy with Nixon, and uh, Dan Baum had noted that he, he had spoke with quote the bluntness of a man who after public disgrace and a stretch in federal prison had little left to protect. And uh, Ehrlichman had candidly acknowledged, uh, some of you might've heard this quote before, but he had said that quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. Do you understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal for uh, to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate hippies with marijuana and the blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. He would go on to say that uh, we understood that the drugs were not the health problem we were making them out to be. But it was such a perfect issue that we couldn't resist. <sighs> the central theme of Nixon's drug legislation, the criminalization of addiction, had openly refuted the Supreme Court's ruling in the case of Robinson v. California in 1962. It's a really interesting case. I haven't heard many people talk about it before, but it definitely deserves more attention with uh, with uh, with the modern perspective of the war on drugs. Uh, the case concerned one Lawrence Robinson, who was charged by the state of California with being addicted to the use of narcotics. They happened to have a law which specifically made it illegal to be an addict. Uh, he was essentially arrested on the street. Uh, the officers had had written in a report that Robinson had admitted to being an addict. Robinson later denied this, but moot point, it made its way up to the Supreme Court. Uh, it's also important to consider that uh, at the time when he was arrested, he was neither under the influence of narcotics, nor was he suffering withdrawal symptoms, nor did he possess heroin or any other controlled substance. Uh, now, even though the scourge of heroin abuse continues to lead millions to demonize opioid addicts, uh, six justices on the Supreme Court sh uh, struck down that unconstitutional California statute, which made it illegal to be an addict. Uh, they ruled in favor of Robinson and noted that laws which criminalize the, quote, disease of addiction, quote, would doubtless, uh, would doubtless universally be thought to be an infliction of cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, simply put, the court had dealt a strike blow to the rising legislative efforts which had uh, aimed to incarcerate addicts, especially if they were not, quote, guilty of any antisocial behavior. Uh, in a separate concurring opinion, I really enjoyed this, uh, Justice Douglas had elaborated on his belief that the incarceration of addicts was a form of cruel and unusual punishment. He really used strong language to express his opinion here. Uh, the imprisonment of addicts he opined, was a, quote, barbarous action, which our nation cannot, quote, tolerate in our present age of enlightenment, end quote. The purpose of the California statute, in his words, 
quote, is not to cure, but to penalize, end quote, a choice which he had remarked had ignored the American Medical Association's position that applying criminal sanctions to substance abusers effectively disrupted their, quote, possible treatment and re rehabilitation and therefore should be abolished. So while it is true that this decision made it clear that addiction cannot be a criminal offense, the justices did remark that it is well within the government's right to regulate the possession or trafficking of these substances. And that's what essentially led to these laws coming into place. Um, but to, to back up Ehrlichman's claim, it, it's a really uh, striking claim. Uh, it's really hard to believe that Nixon went out of his way to literally incarcerate hippies and black people, but there's a lot of evidence to back up his claim. Uh, the personal diary of uh, Nixon's White House Chief of Staff, H.R. Haldeman, had one eye-catching entry uh, from April of 69. Uh, Nixon had emphasized that, quote, you have to face the fact that the whole problem is really the blacks. The key is to devise a system that recognized this while not appearing to. Uh, Let's see, over in, uh, in, in December of 1970, uh, Nixon and his uh, friends were talking about a recent episode of All in the Family while in the White House. Uh, the three of them were discussing how Archie Bunker, the aging blue collar family patriarch, had been pitted against his hippie son-in-law who had invited a queer person over to the family home. And uh, Nixon and his friends had agreed that the show's purpose was to quote, upgrade the hippie and to quote, frame the, square hard, uh, frame the square hard hat, end quote, as a villain. Uh, once uh, Archie, the, the father of the family, had realized that one of his longtime beer drinking, football playing, arm wrestling buddies was attracted only to men, Nixon, as he put it, turned the goddamn thing off because you see homosexuality, dope, immorality in general. These are the enemies of strong societies. That's why the communists and the left-wingers are pushing the stuff. They're trying to destroy us. Uh, the anti-war and black power youth of the 1960s displayed a desire to upend establishment politics. And because of this, it became really advantageous for the Nixon administration to, to try and vilify these young adults. Uh, interestingly, the previous uh, administration had tasked the CIA, the CIA with investigating various national protest movements for supposed communist influences. None were ever found. Um, one really controversial provision of the new drug laws was the no-knock rule, which essentially permitted uh, law enforcement agents to ignore the Fourth Amendment and break into people's homes in the search of illegal drugs. In July of 1970, one senator uh, Sam Irvin had argued before Congress that the new uh, no-knock rule had afforded policemen uh, what he called the ability to uh, break into uh, family homes in, quote, the same way that burglars now enter those dwellings, quote, uh, end quote, which was absolutely inconsistent with the Fourth Amendment provisions, which had, quote, prevailed since this nation became a republic. Uh, it, eventually, Congress would repeal the no-knock provision in 1974, and the Supreme Court would reaffirm the necessity of the knock and announce rule in the 90s. Even though that happened, no-knock raids still go on to this very day and have gone on since <laughs> since Harry Anslinger was in office. Um, all you need to uh, the only proof you need is uh, the recent case of uh, the, the unfortunate case of Breonna Taylor. These sort of things still go on. It's all, it's really tragic is what it is. But um, hippies, black activists and political, uh, politically liberal youth were not the first group of people that were painted as violent drug abusers. Such propaganda has for a very long time been used to ostracize various minorities. Uh, for over a century, uh, Latinx and Black citizens have been stereotyped as violent drug abusers. Uh, America's first drug czar, Harry Anslinger, had infamously 
incorporated shockingly racist rhetoric into his uh, congressional testimonies and radio spots. Uh, though most of his racist diatribes are unfit to print, uh, it's worthy to note that he felt that, quote, the primary reason to outlaw marijuana is its effect on the degenerate races, end quote. Uh, Ehrlichman's 1981 memoir, Witness to Power, had noted that Nixon wasn't too different from Anslinger. Uh, the president had believed that, quote, blacks were genetically inferior to whites, end quote, and that the drug abuse epidemic was spilling over from the minority communities. Uh, the cannabis prohibition was definitely successful in the president's eyes. Uh, one New York Daily News article from the early 70s noted that nearly 300,000 citizens were arrested under the new cannabis law by 1973, quote, the majority of whom were African-American. Uh, coincidentally, uh, Nixon and Anslinger also believed that cannabis induced addiction, social deviance, quote, insanity, criminality, and death, as well as pacifism and communist brainwashing. All quotes of Anslinger, but it's clear that Nixon believed the same way. Um, I, I really have to say that Nixon didn't have the best approach to this whole thing. He bumbled along the way. Uh, his approach to tackle public enemy number one wasn't always graceful. There are many, many embarrassing slip ups on the way. Uh, one of the best stories came from uh, when he had a when he held a bipartisan hearing on uh, on drug abuse. Essentially, he was addressing the subcommittee to investigate juvenile delinquency. And after he had touched on a broad array of methods to combat uh, drug trafficking, uh, he had brought on his friend, Arthur Linkletter, a popular media personality and father of five. Uh, Nixon had invited his, quote, old personal friend uh, because he wanted to allow him to speak with, quote, great knowledge and eloquence uh, on the matter of drug abuse. Uh, for the past two weeks, a link letter had been sharing a story on the radio and television with uh, listeners across America. Uh, essentially, as he put it, quote, my beautiful 20 year old daughter leaped to her death from her apartment while she was in a depressed suicidal frame of mind, end quote, because she had come to believe that, quote, she was losing her mind from reoccurring bad trips from LSD. End quote. Uh, while it is true that autopsy results indicated that no recreational substances were in his daughter's uh, system at the time of her death, uh, Linkletter uh, essentially began a lifelong campaign to demonize LSD and laid that foundation within the halls of Congress during this meeting. You know, from Nixon's perspective, Linkletter was a lovable American who could deliver salient emotional appeals to the viewing public. How could it go wrong? Uh, Linkletter first started talking about uh, basic issues surrounding adolescent drug abuse, but his credibility on the topic of drug abuse should have come into question when he started asserting that children across America were, quote, becoming frightened, end quote, of methionine. Methionine? I had to look this up. It's an essential amino acid. That bears no inebriating effects. I'm not sure if that was a typo in the in the congressional record or if that was something that he actually said. But you know, I'm actually willing to think that. Well, beyond this, he had said that um, in certain areas of the country, children were quote so crazy and insane as to inject into their bloodstream peanut butter because somebody said that peanut butter gives you a high, and they die from that mayonnaise they are inserting into their veins, period. <laughs> My guess was that the foundation for his expertise came from his many decades of researching uh, uh, drug abuse on the popular television segment, Kids Say the Darndest Things, but you know, that's just my guess. Um, it's just really ridiculous. Imagine if somebody like Pierce Morgan came on the telly and said that kids were injecting ketchup or mustard to get high. Like, what in the heck? It, with the modern lens, Link Letter sounded like a fool, but people took him seriously at the time. Um, uh, two months after the shootings at Kent State, 
the Youth International Party had organized their first marijuana smoke in protest in the District of Columbia. And this protest, held on July 4th of 1970, was attended by approximately 25,000 young Americans who had flagrantly disobeyed the uh, cannabis prohibition, which was now in tatters, thanks to Larry. Um, following a contentious discussion about the placement of cannabis within Schedule 1, uh, the majority of our nation's representatives did not feel comfortable enough to place the herb in Schedule 1, as suggested by Nixon and Attorney General John Mitchell. Uh, unfortunately, psilocybin and LSD were not afforded the same grace, although the medical applications for cannabis were largely supported by anecdotal evidence at the time. Clinical studies utilizing psychedelics had clearly shown their promise as novel pharmaceutical therapies, but, you know, uh, damn the facts to hell. That was, that was their motto. Uh, in order to come up with an agreement about cannabis, uh, the herb was temporarily placed within Schedule 1 pending a congressional review. Uh, Congress established the 73-member National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, a group known as the Schaefer Commission. Uh, Governor Richard Schaefer of California, handpicked by Nixon, led a group of law and order politicians to exhaustively investigate the history history, health effects, and social impact of cannabis uh, and its use within America. Governor Schaefer would commission over 50 sub-projects and studies while gathering thousands of pages of testimony from various professional experts. Uh, long story short, uh, Governor Schaefer, uh, Governor Schaefer began his career as a prosecutor who went on to champion a statewide crusade against crime. So Nixon expected that Schaefer was really going to hit this thing hard. Uh, Nixon would tell his chief of staff, Halderman, in May of 1971 that he expected, quote, a goddamn strong statement about marijuana. Can I get that out of this son of a bitching uh, domestic council? Uh, Nixon had clearly requested a report which, quote, tears the ass <laughs> out of those who favored the cannabis uh, over the uh, who had favored the legalization of cannabis. Uh, it was only a week prior that uh, Nixon was complaining to Linkletter in the Oval Office that there were, quote, uh, radical demonstrators in the Capitol and that they were, uh, quote, all on drugs, virtually all. Uh, uh, when uh, Nixon met with Schaefer later in September of that year, uh, the president reiterated his request that the commission's uh, report make it, quote, totally oblivious to the obvious differences between marijuana and other drugs. Uh, Schaefer stood firm and said, uh, no, we're going to release the facts and we're not going to release our statement like a, quote, half-cocked gun. Uh, Nixon would bark back at Schaefer, keep your commission in line. Uh, six months later, uh, Schaefer would come out with a report that pretty much found uh, and confirmed what we now presently know about marijuana that uh, cannabis sp smokers were law-abiding citizens who were not, quote, physically, biochemically, or mentally different, end quote, from non-users, and that the harms of cannabis are insufficient as to justify intrusion by the criminal law into private behavior. Uh, specifically, they made sure to remind the nation that the scientific evidence had shown that the true gateway drugs were, quote, tobacco, followed closely by alcohol. And they also made sure to mention that alcohol abuse was certainly the quote, most destructive drug use pattern, end quote, which America faced. This did not bode well with Nixon and he flat out refused to implement the findings. He had uh, enlisted the help of segregationist Senator uh, James Eastland of Mississippi to pen a scathing rebuke. Uh, his 3,000 page report uh, infamously asserted that if cannabis use were to continue, our nation might wind up, quote, saddled with a large population of semi zombies. Uh, Eastland publicly admitted in December of 1974, years later, that he had, quote, made no apology for injecting his own biases into his one sided congressional hearings. Quote, they were deliberately planned that way. Uh, end result here, uh, Eastland's attempt proved successful. 
Nixon was happy, cannabis became prohibited. Uh, cannabis users saw a fourfold increase in arrest rates. Moreover, mere possession of substances that were closely associated with the counterculture became federal crimes, which could result in decades of imprisonment and disenfranchisement. Without a word being spoken, the, ru the ruling in Robinson was found to be obsolete in the face of the rising war on drugs. Tens of thousands of Vietnam veterans returned home to uh, uh, face the possibility of incarceration because many had actually become addicts while they were over there. Uh, the, the paradigm that was in America was one that did not focus on the rehabilitation in, of drug addicts in any substantive manner. That's not what the new drug laws were about. It was about putting away people in jail and not giving them the help they needed. And uh, just to wrap everything up, there was one really stunning quote that I found in uh, the White House recordings that just really confirmed everything that I thought and knew about Nixon and his beliefs about drug abuse. Um, it was in May, no, March of 1972. He was talking about the new drug laws with uh, Halderman, I think it was. And he was rhetorically asking, you know, who cares about the treating of the addicts, the Yaffe stuff, or I'm sorry, Jaffe stuff. Uh, Dr. Jerome uh, Jaffe had been recently appointed as Nixon's drug czar and was trying to implement a methadone treatment program for heroin addicted Vietnam veterans. Nixon didn't like the idea. He thought that giving uh, drugs to drug addicts was a bad idea. Uh, not too different than the idea of giving LSD to alcoholics, but point being, he didn't like it. And he made the point of saying, you know, who cares about this guy? Who cares about the treating of addicts? Now, Halderman, who was right there next to him, uh, was I, I'm guessing he wasn't aware that this was a rhetorical question. He provided a really shocking, shocking isn't even the right word. It, it's just, it's an appalling answer. He had said that, the mothers don't care because their children aren't addicts. But what you really care about is this son of a bitch is going to come up and try and slip your kid a packet of marijuana. <laughs> Nixon responded, yeah, that's right. I mean, what can you make of that besides just complete denial of the situation? They did not care. It's quite apparent. Yeah. And so you have, you know, public health policy being used as a system of control rather than looking out for the, the health of the public. And, yeah. you know, these substances are placed in Schedule 1, which is, you know, is the kind of highest, you know, it's this, this status where there are certain, you know, criteria you need, like needs to be kind of high potential for abuse and you no know, recognized medical use. And psychedelics so expect none of these things. Um, and at the time, was there, was there kind of pushback from the medical and scientific community on, on this kind of prohibition? Yeah, plenty. Uh, the congressional re record is just littered with it. Um, one of the best examples I found was uh, Dr. Leo Hollister. Um, he had openly refuted the scheduling system imposed by the Controlled Substances Act in his July 1970 testimony. Uh, the VA expert on psychoactive drugs had made it clear that he was, quote, unable to find any scientific colleague who agrees with the scheduling of drugs in the proposed legislation, uh, nor have I been able to find anyone who was consulted about the proposed schedules. The unfortunate scheduling which groups together such diverse drugs, such as heroin, LSD, and marijuana, perpetuates a fallacy long apparent to our youth. These drugs are not equivalent in pharmacological effects or in the degree of danger they represent to individuals and to society. If scheduling of drugs is retained in the legislation which is ultimately passed, the law will become a laughing stock. He had made it clear that uh, the medical community was expressing concern over the increasingly harsh criminal sanctions for those who, quote, merely used drugs, end quote. He had reminded our nation that turning abuse, uh, drug abusers into a class of criminals was a decision that, quote, only few reasonable people believe is sound. An opinion which was rooted in the fact that courthouses had become inundated with drug offenders who simply 
required medical attention and psychotherapy. Uh, Dr. Hollister had also remarked that these criminal prohibitions have already exacted, quote, a dreadful toll in time, money, and human misery, which has not discouraged to any appreciable extent the use of drugs. Uh, the director of the NIMH, Dr. Stanley Yolis, uh, also shared this sentiment when he uh, uh, provided testimony to Congress in September of 69. He noted that in his professional experience, uh, he was aware that the various harms of incarcerating drug offenders, quote, defeats the whole purpose, end quote, of rehabilitating drug offenders. Dr. Sidney Cohen, the doctor of the Division of Narcotic Division and Drug Abuse at the NIMH also concurred with this position. In March of 1970, Dr. Louis, or rather Louis Julian West of the American Psychiatric Association made it clear that the whole classification system imposed by the Controlled Substances Act, quote, confused, end quote, the medical utility of these substances, quote, with their actual potential for social abuse, end quote a mistake which he had described as being a deficiency of, quote, sufficient medical and psychopharmacological expertise. Uh, he had noted that it, that it was quite strange that there are plenty of amphetamine analogs placed in Schedule Three, despite the fact that they were among the most dangerous of all drugs in the black market and uh, available um, it, and in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, what else? Well, the, the, the really big, uh, uh, the one senator, the one congressperson who had really stood in defense of these medicines was Senator Robert Kennedy. I, I really got to applaud him. He uh, did everything he could to make sure Congress knew what they were doing when they were trying to prohibit these substances and their research. Um, although it may come as a surprise to a lot of people, he openly advocated for psychedelic assisted psychotherapy because he understood the potential that it could have for people. Uh, his wife had personally undergone LSD therapy for her alcoholism, and uh, she was actually able to maintain sobriety until, uh, until Bobby was assassinated later in uh, June of 1968, which is really unfortunate. But um, uh, back in 66, uh, when Kennedy was holding his uh, hearings, uh, once LSD had become illegal, uh, dozens of high profile government uh, experts had surprisingly praised the value of LSD in uh, their testimony. Notably, uh, Dr. Martin H. Engel, former chief medical director of the VA, had testified that after treating over a thousand patients, quote, no reports of serious complications, end quote, had arisen. And that quote, or yeah, and that uh, the studies were quote, so promising, end quote, that the VA had already began to prepare to expand its work. <sighs> if only that was still going on. Um, uh, several different experts had uh, opposed the, uh, had opposed the criminalization of the possession of LSD. This included James Goddard, the former commissioner of the FDA, um, Dr. Richard Bloom, a psychopharmacologist at Stanford, Dr. Charles Dahlberg, a research psychiatrist at uh, William Allenson White Institute, and also Dr. Sidney Cohen. And get this, even the President's Commission on Law Enforcement and the Task Force on Narcotics and Drug Abuse, known for their tough on-crime reputations, also opposed laws which criminalize the personal use of LSD. It's, it was strange to read that. I'll tell you that. It was strange to read that uh, in the uh, congressional record. Um, by 1973, the NIMH had spent $7.5 million in taxpayer money uh, re uh, funding research in this field. But unfortunately, Congress let it all go to waste. Uh, Cohen, like I had mentioned earlier, had, uh, although he did uh, opposed the criminalization of the possession of LSD. He had wagged his finger at uh, LSD use in so many ways throughout the years. Um, although his 1960 study indicated that LSD use was, uh, the, the medical use of LSD was, quote, astonishingly safe, uh, he had openly rebuked Larry in Congress uh, by saying things like, um, uh, 
uh, the growth of the youth counterculture is most alarming because LSD abuse led one to lose, quote, all cultural values, the loss of feeling of right and wrong, of good and bad, that LSD users were, quote, deculturated, lost to society, lost to themselves, hung up in a fantasy and a dreamlike non-existence. So a lot of people were saying that LSD definitely had medical value, but even some of these same people were wagging their finger at the idea that uh, anyone should use it, much less researchers. <sighs> yeah. And so there's also this, you know, alongside the medical dimension of the fact that they're, they're kind of physiologically and psychologically safe if, if administered the right way and they can be used for healing. There's also this kind of religious or spiritual dimension, right? Because they've been used for you know, a long time in you know, places like the Native American church, using peyote, you know, using sacraments. And people, you know, even with LSD, people found, you know, produces these kinds of spiritual experiences. Um, mm -hmm. And you'd think there would be a kind of, you know, a, a freedom of religion, uh, quite a straightforward freedom of religion case to make great for this in the US. At the time, was there anyone arguing for that when the initial prohibition came along? Uh, there was one notable example. Yes. I really got to give credit to, uh, uh, Reverend Itkin. Um, I'm trying to remember Reverend Michael Francis Itkin. Yes. On May 26th of 1966, he delivered a testimony to Congress. I was blown away when I first read this in the congressional record because I didn't, exp I didn't see this coming. Um, he was a bishop of the Metropolitan Diocese of Philadelphia, New York, as well as an abbot in the Brotherhood of the Love of Christ. Um, donning the proverbial armor of God, <laughs> the courageous reverend plainly admitted uh, in his congressional testimony that fellow clergy had took part within, quote, study groups attached to our parishes, which had utilized various entheogens as, quote, an adjunct to the sacramental life and the life of prayer and meditation. Uh, he had considered the prohibition of entheogens to be a quote, intolerable abuse of our constitutional rights, end quote, because of the fact that these substances have served as a quote, adjunct to the sacramental life and to the methods of prayer and meditation for many indigenous Christians and those who were quote, independent seekers after the truth and grace of God. Now, try and imagine being a senator in the 60s and listening to this guy speak. Um, he was definitely facing a tough crowd, no doubt about it. Uh, he understood the fact that a lot of people wouldn't be able to accept his testimony. And in an effort to circumvent these sort of biases, uh, the well-prepared reverend uh, noted the numerous world religions which presently utilized entheogenic sacraments and quoted scripture uh, from Genesis, Numbers, Romans, and Revelations as a, uh, as a sampling of the pertinent biblical material to appeal to the Christians attending his ceremony. Uh, he even quoted this one verse from uh, the King James Version uh, uh, from Romans 14. Uh, for, one who, uh, for one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Uh, Reverend Icken had specifically requested that those in attendance not construe his testimony to be some sort of justification for the indiscriminate use of LSD, for he also agreed with other experts that the uh, illicit use of LSD should be curbed by properly educating our nation's youth. However, he made sure to remind his audience that the prohibition of antigens highlighted what he called a quote, clear and present violation of the free exercise clause. Now, for those who weren't familiar with the subjective effects of psychedelics, uh, the Reverend had reminded uh, those who were listening that uh, the consumption of these substances is a, what he called a parallel of the spiritual experiences classically described by various Western theologians. Uh, and while he would note that the mystical experiences which entheogens reliably afforded took place, uh, took place over the course of a few hours, 
traditional methods normally required many years of dedication. Uh, however, he had remarked that cheap grace is never afforded by our creator and that entheogens required, quote, as much discipline as the traditional means of seeking the divine. Uh, waxing poetic at the end of his testimony, he had concluded uh, by reminding Congress that these experiences can serve as a transient dissolution of the various obstacles which have been set in place by the quote, personal ego of man. Such an experience, he opined, could permit the quote, grace and light of God to have a free chance to operate in the consciousness of man. The Bishop reminded Congress that the objective value of these sacraments uh, relies completely upon the method in which they are used and respectively urged respectfully urged Congress to permit the bona fide sacramental ingestion of these substances. Now, even though there is this really great testimony from Reverend Icken, in the years after his testimony, Congress started openly gossiping about this one case about the neo-American church. You may have heard of it before. Um, it, it's just littered all over the congressional record. They, they love talking about it and the novelty of it. Essentially, this group of hippies uh, had faced some serious drug trafficking charges related to uh, uh, peyote, LSD, and cannabis, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, following a, uh, a landmark peyote case called People v. Woody, which we'll talk about later, um, they had essentially tried to use the guise of religious freedom as a post hoc justification to avoid conviction for these serious drug trafficking charges. Um, that was a really interesting case to read. Um, there is a lot of evidence from which to draw for the judge to make the proper decision in that case. Um, the, the judge in that case, uh, the, the case was United States v. Uh, Kutch, Cuck. K U C H, uh, Judge uh, Gessel had notably uh, had dutifully noted that the church's uh, faith system was an absurdist mockery of traditional religious systems. Uh, for example, the church's symbol, a three-eyed toad, uh, appeared on the group's catechism, which was packed with quote uh, with what the judge called uh, quote goofy nonsense, contradictions, and irreverent expressions. And uh, the same catechism also firmly asserted that the churchgoers, quote, have the right to practice our religion, even if we are a bunch of filthy drunken bums. The official song of the church, Puff Puff the Magic Dragon, uh, is seemingly palatable in the face of the official motto of the church, victory over horse shit. <laughs> Judith Cuck, uh, Kutch, I still don't know her name, uh, the self-proclaimed primate of the Potomac, had her claim for religious liberty shot down uh, once the judge had remarked that it had become quite clear that the inclination for recreational drug abuse and not sincere religious belief was, quote, the coagulant of this organization and the reason for its existence. Um, after this case, there were a bunch of people in Congress who lambasted uh, the idea that entheogens could serve as actual sacraments. Um, uh, though there were people, uh, though there were drug experts saying that indigenous use of these substances did not lead to drug dependence, um, uh, there were people saying pretty terrible things about peyote and uh, these experiences. Uh, for example, um, uh, one Illinois senator, Robert Cherry, was quoted as saying that those who seek mystical insight through entheogenic substances are not confronted with spiritual revelations, but instead were led into what he called, quote, the world of nothing. Uh, Senator Thomas Dodd in June of 65 uh, uh, warned of, quote, pseudo intellectuals who advocate the use of drugs in the search of some imaginary freedoms of the mind. Uh, it's really remarkable that Reverend Aiken was even given a time and place to actually give that testimony, but it's clear that it fell on deaf ears. Um, I, I should remark though that Congress did afford the Native American church, not the New American, the Native American church, uh, statutory protection to possess and consume peyote uh, for individual members, 
And um, uh, that was specifically codified in 1971, but we can talk about that a little more later. Okay. And so apart from just kind of writing off people's attempts to, you know, justify this as, as freedom of religion, writing them off as just joke, you know, joke churches, like in the case of the, uh, the near American church, what other ways do, um, does the government kind of justify imposing upon, you know, limits of, of religious freedom? Are you saying what conditions need to be necessary for religious freedom to be imposed upon? That's another way of saying it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, to quote every lawyer ever, it depends. <laughs> um, religious freedom cases can cover a wide variety of topics. So if we're talking about uh, entheogenic case law, there's no perfect answer for this question. But generally speaking, whenever religious freedom claims are brought before a court, it's not because the parties seeking legal protection are there for some hypothetical burden that they may one day face. It's not like I can go to a court and say, hey, um, uh, I haven't faced a burden, but I want freedom, religious freedom, uh, give, give it to me now. No, it doesn't happen. You have to already be burdened for a case to be brought forward. Um, for example, the UDV was raided in 1999. Uh, their shipment of ayahuasca was taken and they were uh, denied um, the right to consume their sacrament for several years. And that's what led them to bring their case to the federal courts. Um, now, once a case comes to trial, the, the process which actually determines whether or not religious freedom claims can be upheld comes down to a process called the Sherbert test. Uh, that was inspired by a case in the 60s called Sherbert v. Werner, and that allows courts to weigh not only the burdened party's religious freedom, uh, but it also weighs against the compelling interests of the government to see which is weightier, which is more important. Now, the first step of this process is for the burden party to aptly demonstrate that they have a one serious, or, excuse me, sincere uh, religious conviction, religious belief, which is two being substantially burdened. Now, if uh, if the burdened parties can meet this uh, burden of proof. The, uh, the next step uh, would go to uh, the government. It is then for the government to uh, prove the case from here on out. So the second step, the second prong of the Sherbert test uh, would be where the government would have to prove that their, uh, that their burden, that the burden that they are imposing upon this person is in furtherance of a compelling government interest. Now, generally speaking, government, uh, compelling government interests uh, in these sorts of cases related to entheogens usually come in the form of protecting the health and safety of the general population as well as those who consume these substances. Now, compelling government interests uh, can and certainly should justify the restriction of certain religious practices which endanger uh, let's say the welfare of others. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has defined these exceptions as, quote, only the gravest abuses endangering paramount interests. Now, hypothetically speaking, it would certainly be justifiable for the government to have a compelling interest in prohibiting religiously inspired uh, violations of all traffic laws or deific decrees of murder, you know, being commanded by God to take the life of another. I've actually read cases concerning the latter. It's, let's just say religious freedom was not the, uh, the focus of that case. Um, but if the government can't aptly demonstrate that the application of the burden is in furtherance of uh, their previously mentioned compelling government interest, the case is settled in favor of the burden party. However, the government's usually able to satisfy this burden. So it then goes on to the third step where the government must convince the court that the application of the burden is already the least restrictive means of furthering their compelling government interest. Now, the term least restrictive means can be a little confusing, so I'll phrase it a little bit differently. Uh, the government must prove that there is absolutely 
no possible scenario where the religious act in question can be somewhat accommodated in some fashion by the government. Now, if the government cannot meet the burden of proof in demonstrating that the application of the burden is the least restrictive means of furthering their compelling interest, that's a mouthful, then the religious communicants have gained protection for their previously burdened acts. Uh, for example, when the UDV's case was heard by the Supreme Court, the justices unanimously agreed about the fact that the government could most certainly accommodate the UDV because of the fact that a much larger church, the Native American church, already holds statutory uh, a statutory exemption allowing them to possess and ingest peyote unlike the general population. And in this case, it was clear that the DOJ could not make a good faith argument that no, ex that no exceptions could be made for the UDV and their small congregation when a substantially similar exception was already in place for millions of indigenous Americans. Now, if the government can prove that the application of the burden is already the least restrictive means of furthering their compelling interest, then the, the claims for religious freedom can be shot down, unfortunately. That's how the cookie crumbles sometimes. But don't forget, there's always the appeals process. Um, but you know, if we're talking about antigenic sacraments, judges from across the political spectrum are going to have differing opinions on this topic. There's no modern judicial consensus by any means. Um, you, you may, you'll certainly find a lot of conservative judges who would shoot down these kind of claims. But at the same time, there are a lot of conservative judges, like uh, ones you might find in the Federalist Society, who are so utterly afraid of challenging judicial precedent related to religious freedom that they will rule in favor of such cases. Um, some li liberal judges, which might have a pro-drug stance, might rule in favor of these sorts of cases, while some may uh, say no. It's, it's really a mixed bag. And um, in the meantime, there is no consensus to say the least. It's a case by case basis. Right. And so you mentioned the, the use of POC by the Native American church. How, like, what's the legal history there as to how they won the right to, to keep that, that tradition? Um, that was a long and hard battle. Um, it all started in the late 19th century. The first published reference to peyote was in a, uh, a report that J. Lee Hall uh, sent to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, it was in 1886 that uh, this fellow had asserted that the uh, Kiowa and Comanche people had collected, quote, a certain kind of cactus, which he said, quote, produces the same effect as opium. Now, this misleading report had alerted the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Uh, who had worked with various local and state governments to prohibit the use of peyote within reservations themselves. Uh, the, uh, the Kiowa Comanche Reservation first saw these prohibitions in 1888. Uh, dozens would soon follow. And the media's response would be really swift in denigrating these religious practices. Uh, for example, the Mitchell Capitol would uh, tell its readers in June of 1906 that the local indigenous people had become, quote, get ready, uh, driveling idiots who now chatter like monkeys, speaking neither English nor their native tongue intelligently. Oh boy. Um, unknown to the native, uh, unknown to the United States government at the time, the indigenous people of the Americas had been using peyote for several thousand years within bona fide religious rites as a sacrament. Um, uh, one anthropologist traced the modern origin of pietism to the Mescalero Apache people who had first learned of its use from indigenous Mexican tribes like the Huichol people. Uh, it was then spread to the uh, Kiowa Comanche people before finding its way into all the different uh, Plains tribes across North America. Um, by the end of World War I, it had spread pretty much across the country because so many servicemen, indigenous servicemen, had uh, gotten together in uh, during the war and shared their beliefs and practices. And this quickly led to it being spread. Now, at this point, the government became became aware of how popular the new religion was in the reservations. Um, uh, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada had passed statewide prohibitions. Uh, against peyote, and Congress would uh, begin their own efforts 
in early 1918, came to a head in February of March, February and March, and uh, uh, Representative Hayden, Carl Hayden, I think it was, had submitted his uh, bill, the Hayden bill, to Congress at a time when prohibition had already been ratified by like a dozen states. Uh, the Hayden bill had specifically prohibited the use of peyote within all indigenous reservations across America and clearly worried about the uh, survival of their faith. Uh, 10 Native American representatives and three anthropologists testified within Congress that peyote was a sacrament essential to the Native American church. Uh, perhaps the most compelling of these testimonies was that of Albert Hensley, a Winnebago man who had been sent to the Carlisle Indian School years prior. Hensley would testify that peyote embodies what he called, quote, the body of Christ, just as the communion bread is believed to be a portion of Christ's body by other Christian denominations. Christ spoke of a comforter who was to come. It never came to Indians until it was sent by God in the form of this holy medicine. Though the Hayden bill passed the House, the Senate uh, shot it down, thanks in large part to the efforts of uh, Senator Robert Owen, who had actually claimed a Cherokee and, uh, ancestry and had worked with the, uh, the, the people years prior. He had successfully argued that the bill uh, violates the First Amendment. And Congress was, or rather the Senate was uh, in agreement about that. They voted uh, against the bill. Uh, now aware that the, the church was facing discrimination, a large body of uh, pietists had gathered in Oklahoma in October of the same year in 1918 to collectively sign a charter uh, of incorporation for the Native American church, which uh, aim to foster what they called, quote, their Christian religion with the practice of the peyote sacrament, end quote. Uh, now this action legally, uh, well, technically met uh, the standards that were required for legal recognition by the state of Oklahoma, which theoretically should have meant that they uh, would have gained protection, but in reality they didn't. Uh, the response to the newly formed church would be uh, quick and uh, quite denigrative. Uh, for example, um, the, what was it, the Augustana? Um, one Wisconsin church had a publication. Yeah, yeah, the, the Lutheran Companion, uh, where they had, uh, had an article called Infection Points. They were talking about the newly formed Pietist church and compared the, uh, the faith to a disease. Uh, the publication noted that, um, uh, these churches were epicenters of what they called, quote, heathenism and its corresponding degradation will, in time, if not eradicated, infect others. Uh, it also said that the Native American church was a, quote, religious cult whose habit forming sacrament elicits paralyzing and thoroughly demoralizing, end quote, side effects. Uh, unsurprisingly, uh, these sorts of sentiments continue to this very day. Uh, I found a, a sermon from uh, Pastor Stephen Anderson of the Faithful Word Baptist Church. This fellow thought that uh, the NAC was a fraudulent church who uh, was spreading a quote, perversion of the gospel of Christ. Uh, and it claimed that its practitioners were practicing quote, necromancy and uh, were visiting uh, demonic spirits within their hallucinations. Oh boy. Um, now, while the Hayden Bill failed to pass Congress, uh, there were dozens of uh, organizations that had aimed to prohibit peyote at a statewide level. So by the mid 20th century, dozens of states had already passed uh, prohibitions on peyote. And it was getting to be a bit difficult for the church to survive. And it wasn't until uh, the early 1960s that a case finally came through and the church began to be recognized in the way that it should. Um, long story short, it was a case called People v. Woody. And it, uh, it started when three Navajo men were conducting a peyote ceremony in a desert Hogan in a, on, the, uh, on the California-Nevada border. 
and uh, some uh, law enforcement officers were surveilling the ceremony from a distance and had certified that the, uh, um, the, the people inside had in fact consumed peyote and then went inside, arrested them. <sighs> While they're being arrested, one of the congregants, uh, Jack Woody, had pointed, or rather nodded his head over to a framed uh, placard on the wall that had said that, uh, let me get the let me get the quote here. It was uh, the Articles of Incorporation of their church, uh, which, yep, uh, it informed the officers that they that they had quote held explicit faith and hope and belief in the Almighty God and declare full, competent, and everlasting faith in our church, that we further pledge ourselves to work for unity with the sacramental use of peyote and its religious use. Imagine being a police officer and reading that. <laughs> That's an admission of guilt. That's an admission of guilt. So they were arrested. They went to trial. The they they tried to uh, argue um, uh, that they were using it as a sacrament, like they should. And unfortunately, they were issued suspended sentences, given probation. Uh, they appealed the case, went all the way up to the Supreme Court of California, who had ruled in their favor, uh, because the Supreme Court of the United States had just ruled on the case of Sherbert v. Verner, uh, California's highest court now needed to apply what is known as the Sherbert test or strict scrutiny to uh, California's prohibition of peyote. Uh, in August of 64, it was, uh, California Supreme Court ruled in favor of these three churchgoers and uh, plainly uh, plainly remarked that they were participating in, quote, the bona fide pursuit of a religious faith. Now, that's pretty strong language. You can't really be ambiguous about that. Uh, Justice Tobriner, writing for the majority, noted that the NAC's belief that peyote, quote, embodies the Holy Spirit and that those who partake of peyote enter into direct contact with God. This is some pretty uh, trippy stuff to be reading in a, in a judicial decision, I tell you. But um, after uh, considering the Sherbert ruling, the California Attorney General's admission that peyote fails to elicit permanent deleterious injury to NAC members and that numerous state laws had already afforded uh, religious protections to the NAC, California's highest court effectively applied the principle set forth in Sherbert and set the wheels in motion for an even more important case in Texas. Now, because of the fact that um, the doors were, were becoming popular, uh, people became more and more familiar with peyote and mescaline. Um, and soon enough, people were uh, lining up in southern Texas, uh, trespassing on private property, trying to harvest this endangered desert cactus. Now, Texas officials quickly uh, took notice of this and decided to pass the Dangerous, uh, the Dangerous Drugs Act of 1967. It was a statewide law in Texas, which prohibited the use of the use and possession of peyote under all circumstances, whether or not one was indigenous. Now, this led to backlash within the uh, native communities and long story short, uh, they responded with a humble act of civil disobedience. In March of 1968, one uh, congregant of the NAC, his name was David Clark, had volunteered to be arrested for the possession of peyote. Um, he, this was done under the direction of the president of the Native American church, uh, Frank Takes Gunn, love his name. Um, uh, and after being directed by the president of the NSC to do this, uh, David, David Clark had you know, placed his freedom on the line in defense of his faith. And uh, the presiding judge, in light of the ruling in Woody, had found that the Dangerous Drug Act had violated Clark's free exercise of his sincere faith and uh, dismissed the charges. So uh, in response, the, uh, local indigenous leaders had effectively lobbied the Texas legislature to amend or rather repeal the act and enable some protections for uh, indigenous pietists. The state acquiesced, but not in the way that they should. Uh, they would only permit the sale and possession of peyote to anyone who was, quote, uh, with not less than 25% Indian blood. A very controversial move, and um, that has led to a lot of um, 
a lot of issues within within the Native American church, largely because it's a uh, racist policy, which effectively tries to breed the religion out of existence, essentially. Uh, it forces indigenous, indigenous people to, to uh, rather compels them to marry other indigenous people if they want to keep their faith. It's, it's fallacious in many regards. And unfortunately it's, uh, that is the law of the land now. But um, uh, after uh, this Texas case, Congress took note and said, you know what? The NAC deserves some protection. We're gonna give them a uh, uh, statute which gives them uh, a, an affirmative defense in case they were ever arrested for possession of peyote. Um, and this went, uh, was, even after this, there was still uh, drama. There were people being shot down uh, in, uh, like in the case of uh, State v. Soto in Oregon, uh, a Native American, uh, his, uh, he was tried and convicted of possessing peyote. It continued to happen for years, but it wasn't until uh, the case of Employment Division v. Smith, really popular case, long story short, uh, a member of the Native American church was fired by his employer after having attended a peyote ceremony and uh, was uh, was denied unemployment benefits because of the circumstances of his firing. He appealed the decision. The appeals court uh, ruled in favor of Smith. Uh, the state of Oregon appealed again. The Supreme Court of Oregon, again, ruled in favor of Smith, uh, but it wasn't until the Supreme Court of the United States took on the case uh, where they essentially shot down uh, Smith's right to freely exercise his faith and not face discrimination for uh, practicing uh, um, uh, an uncommon faith, we'll say. But long story short, Congress did not like this reinterpretation of the free exercise clause in the First Amendment. There was uproar across the country. Congress responded by uh, writing the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which uh, reaffirmed the Sherbert test and effectively allowed for the UDV to win their case in 2006 and to continue to consume their sacrament of ayahuasca. Um, at the present day, the, uh, the Native American church still faces problems here and there, but more or less they're better off than they were 50, 60 years ago. Right. So you have PAs being used by the Native American church and you mentioned the UDV, the Uniel. De vegetal, mm -hmm. this kind of Brazilian ayahuasca church. Um, and is there anything more to say about, about their, um, how it is that they came to be able to use their sacrament on US soil? Yes, um, it was only through uh, a lot of hard work and determination. I really got to give uh, their legal counsel uh, generous applause for the work that they did. Um, they, uh, they fought hard and they, uh, uh, well, um, gosh, they had a victory at every step of the process, but, um, it wasn't until they actually won their, uh, case in 2006 that they, they were able to continue their practices. Long story short, um, their shipment of ayahuasca was seized in 99. They were given a slap on the wrist saying, Hey, if you continue to import this schedule one substance, y'all are going to go to jail for the rest of your life. Now in fear for the survival of their faith, they filed a suit for injunctive relief. And, uh, uh, although they kept getting these victories, the DOJ kept appealing, appealing, appealing. And it wasn't until they got to the Supreme court where surprisingly, uh, eight of the nine justices, uh, unanimously ruled in favor of the church. Uh, only one of the justices did not join because um, I think he had recused himself. Anyway, unanimous decision. Uh, and essentially the Supreme Court would lay waste to the false assertion that uh, ayahuasca is far too dangerous of a substance to be fit for human consumption. Uh, they plainly stated that under the strict scrutiny standard mandated by RIFRA, Quote, the government's mere invocation of the general characteristics of Schedule One substances, uh, quote, cannot carry the day. <laughs> That's pretty strong language. Essentially saying that, uh, yeah, Schedule One drugs, you may make them out to seem really scary, but um, eh, so what? 
Uh, the court conceded that while DMT could be exceptionally dangerous under certain circumstances, the court found, quote, no indication that Congress ever investigated the potential harms related to its sacramental use. Now, even though Congress had placed DMT within the strictest category of controlled substances, this fact did not amount to a compelling government interest which would allow the government to be, quote, relieved of the obligation to satisfy their side of the Sherbert test. Uh, citing Sherbert, the court directly addressed the fear of otherwise insincere people attempting to circumvent the drug laws through a RIFRA claim, reminding the Department of Justice that the Sherbert court dismissed what they called a uh, slippery slope argument. Um, uh, in that case, South Carolina argued that uh, fraudulent unemployment claims by, quote, unscrupulous claimants feigning religious objections would unnecessarily drain the state's funding. Now, uh, though uh, three of the uh, Supreme Court justices had previously ruled against Smith, you know, years prior, they'd actually switched their decision and uh, rather switched their position and clearly saw that uh, the sacramental ingestion of controlled substances is an issue that is clearly worthy of strict constitutional uh, scrutiny. Uh, so they definitely did change their position, but it's, I need to be clear about what the UDV ruling means. It does not allow all ayahuasca churches to operate. It only allowed the UDV. That's what the Supreme Court did with that decision. They, they allowed that church to consume ayahuasca. That's it. Um, there were other churches who also won, like the Santo Daime churches in Oregon, and they also have protection, but they are the only two in the nation, and that's it. At least as far as I know. And so maybe to end on, we can go to the current kind of legal landscape. You know, if someone wanted to um, start a psilocybin church, say, uh, or use any other kind of substance as their, their sacrament, do any of these rulings apply to, to that? Most certainly. Uh, uh, the UDV case would be very instructive. Um, I There is no other case that really comes close to it. I mean, there's a Santo Daime case, yeah, but I mean... Uh, when you're talking about a Supreme Court case, that's uh, that establishes a precedent for sure. Um, I've heard this question about uh, psilocybin-based churches many times and in different forms. It's a really good question to ask, but it needs to be answered in the proper way. And simply put, there is no clear path for churches like these to gain legal protection. Um, now, clearly, the government has permitted isolated cases of sacramental use of peyote and uh, ayahuasca, but uh, what to say about psilocybin mushrooms? What about iboga root bark? What about uh, what about pharmahuasca? I mean, there are a lot of uh, possibilities here, but what to do about this? Um, like I said, the UDV and Santo Daime rulings only apply to those particular churches. It doesn't allow uh, anyone to pick up the practice if they so want. Um, even if one's church is an unofficial branch of the Uniao de Vital, even if uh, even if you put UDV as your personal faith when you're filling out paperwork at the police station because you just got busted for a, a possession of a kilogram of crystalline DMT, you know this stuff doesn't always fly. Um, the only way that somebody can win such a claim is if they fight tooth and nail in court for the, for their right to exercise their faith period. It's a case by case basis. But uh, to try and uh, shift it to a better perspective, um, psilocybin definitely stands to be uh, the dominant force in the upcoming uh, anthogenic case law for a number of different reasons. It's not endangered like other uh, entheogens are. It grows very abundantly on, as far as I'm aware, all, almost every continent. <laughs> um, uh, it also has a, uh, a plethora of chemical and pharmacological similarities to uh, DMT, the active constituent of ayahuasca. And also, uh, there is a wealth of scientific literature on the topic of psilocybin in particular, largely because the majority of modern studies have focused on that substance in particular. Um, but before we get going into whether or not psilocybin-based sacraments fall within the protections of the free exercise clause in RIFRA, we need to think about the chemistry of these substances. Um, 
although psilocybin is considered to be the active constituent of these mushrooms, it's actually the metabolic precursor to the biologically active substance psilocin, which is interestingly a hydroxylated form of DMT. Now, uh, to give this some, uh, so just to reiterate, psilocybin is dephosphorylated in the gut into psilocin that then crosses the blood brain barrier and activates serotonin receptors, just like DMT does. Now, the only difference between DMT and psilocin is it's really remarkable. If you look here, DMT has a, a six membered ring, five membered ring, and uh, the amine right there. The only difference is this little hyd hydroxyl group right here. That is a very minor difference. Chemically speaking, pharmacologically speaking, it does not change the um, fact that both substances are agonists of serotonin 1A, 2A, and 2C receptors. Um, they both have uh, similar metabolites. It's it's really remarkable how similar they are. Uh, the only real diff the only real way that they're different is that one is uh, orally active while one is not. Um, and DMT is only orally active uh, in ayahuasca because of the uh, beta carbolines, which are present there, which inhibit uh, MAO, the enzyme which breaks down DMT normally. But um, uh, pharmacologically speaking, the doses required uh, for ayahuasca, that is purified DMT needed for a full ayahuasca dose. It's strikingly similar to the amount that is used within clinical trials for psilocybin research. It's 30 milligrams plus or minus 10 thereabouts. So not different in terms of dose, in terms of duration of action, about four to six hours, about the same. Uh, because these two substances share so many similarities, one can make a really good argument in a court that there are in fact so many similarities that the two substances, psilocin and DMT, uh, would meet the substantially similar qualifications laid forth in the Federal Analogs Act, essentially saying that these two substances are analogs. They are almost one and the same. Um, back in uh, last year, Dennis McKenna was on London Real, and he was saying that uh, psilocybin is a quote, uh, uh, orally active form of DMT. Uh, Dr. Carhart Harris went on the same program uh, several years prior and said that uh, psilocybin and DMT are virtually the same compound. Um, even back in 1967, uh, Dr. Harris Isbell had remarked at the discussion on psychoactive action of various tryptamine derivatives that, quote, psilocybin and psilocin found in the mushroom give us the same effect as does DMT. They are somewhat longer acting and slower to start. Um, these two substances are essentially one in the same. So it, it would be a bit harder for one to try and ride on the tails of the UDV decision with, let's say, uh, Iboga sacrament, right? With psilocybin, it's remarkably similar in many grounds and therefore stands the best uh, chances at surviving uh, uh, the courts, so to speak. Um, and there have been cases which this has happened. Um, it was only a, at this point, not, not even a full month ago. Wow. Yeah. Not even a full month ago, New Hampshire, their highest court had released a decision where, uh, they had affirmed that the possession of psilocybin mushrooms is in fact a religiously inspired act, which could uh, which should deserve protection under the free exercise clause. Essentially, uh, a fellow by the name of Jeremy Mack had a search warrant seized on his house. Uh, in his safe was a uh, was an amount of psilocybin mushrooms. He was arrested on charges related to that. He had uh, submitted testimony that he was a practitioner of a, quote, shamanic earth-based religion, uh, which had, quote, utilized the mushrooms as a part of his religious worship. And essentially, the New Hampshire court had reversed the lower court's decision, saying that uh, Jeremy Mack was guilty of the offense of possession of psilocybin mushrooms, and effectively remanded the case back to the lower courts 
for further proceedings consistent with their opinion that his act was religiously inspired and was deserving of protection under the free exercise clause. Now, Jeremy Mack is not any unique case. Uh, there's a fellow named Steve Urquhart in Utah. You might have heard of him. Uh, he recently founded a Salt Lake City church known as the Divine Assembly. And their congregants believe that anyone, quote, can directly commune with the divine through the psilocybin sacraments. Now, uh, this minister is far from a stereotypical bohemian. He has uh, he's a practicing lawyer. He has served as a missionary to Brazil and as a Republican in Utah's House of Representatives. As of uh, January 21, uh, he has maintained his position as a, quote, protector of the church and intends to stand in defense of the church if they were to ever face any uh, legal action. And cases like these are only going to become more and more common as the years progress, in my opinion. Yeah, that's fascinating information. I'm sure that's going to be really relevant in the upcoming years. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Sasha. Um, yeah. Where would you send people if they want to look into your work more? I guess I guess your book is the best place to go. Yes, that's going to be available on Amazon in the coming days. Again, the title is Graced by Nature. Uh, my name is uh, spelled without any Cs. Just keep that in mind. And um, uh, there's one last thing that I wanted to say. There's a... Uh, passage that uh, I ended one of my chapters with, and I felt that it could serve as a, uh, a benediction to end the podcast. Uh, Want to hear? Yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Well, uh, you know, some might say that we should give our whole self to the cause of justice and to make a steadfast commitment to upending systems of oppression that we all need to, as they say, stand up and be counted. But uh, uh, James Russell Lowell once described this uh, battle as being in the strife of truth with falsehood. Uh, published in December of 1845, his long form poem, The Present Crisis, had condemned slavery and the upcoming war with Mexico. Uh, it was a poem which Martin Luther King Jr. later quoted in his famous We Shall Overcome speech. Uh, in his poem, Lowell would say that to side with truth is noble and that it is the brave one uh, who stands while the cow, uh, that is the brave one uh, who stands up while the coward stands aside. Now, the real question remains, uh, what's truth? I wish to submit that what, what brief time we've been afforded here on planet Earth should be well spent, living one, uh, lifting one's mind to heaven so as to recognize the divine spark, which all of us carry deep within us during our fleeting existence. If one listens close to the sound of the wind or uh, looks deep in the realms of outer space or uh, simply feels the joy that comes with the tender embrace. We can all hear the call of our creator insisting that we live in harmony with each other. <sighs> Whether we choose to do so by making a series of acts of kindness towards our fellow human beings or devoting our entire lives to building a human, building a human utopia, we all share this, uh, we all share this responsibility and we can't forget that half measures uh, can't suffice in this lifelong battle. With lifelong, uh, rather with genuine dedication and an open heart, we can overcome the worst of odds in life and find the best joy that there is. And that's to genuinely express our compassion in all that we do. Love is the single greatest illuminative force in our existence, and we must lean into it if we expect to su successfully meander the uncertainty of life. And though visions of God are often depicted in terms of brilliant sources of light, Dante poetically described God in the final lines of Paradiso as the love that carries the sun and other stars. If God is truly the love that carries objects throughout time and space, then I pray that God may stimulate our intellect so that we are inspired to take the right action at the right time. Thank you for having me on your podcast, James. Yeah, I'll say amen to that. You're very welcome.